Pop quiz theorists, let me know your answer down in the comments. How do you eat your Oreo cookie? Do you A, just eat it like a normal cookie? What am I even talking about here? Do you B, dunk it in milk and nibble away the soggy portion of the cookie? Do you C, twist the cookie apart and eat it in pieces? Or D, black out and wake up 30 minutes later half naked on the floor covered in crumbs with two full sleeves of Oreos held unaccounted for? Just figured I'd ask, you know, for a friend. Me, I'm a, I'm probably more of a C type of guy. Definitely, definitely C. Internet. Welcome to Food Theory, the show that's here to fill your brain with the most stuff. People often ask me, Matt Pat, why do you want to ruin my childhood? Year after year, channel after channel, episode after episode, you go out of your way to undermine everything I love about Disney and Nintendo and now even Kool-Aid. Why? Well, here's the truth, friends. Come closer and I'll tell you. Closer, closer. I'm not trying. Theorists, I'm just a simple YouTuber who happens to follow the facts wherever they lead. Take today's episode episode as an example. I set out to make a pleasant little video about Oreo cookies. I really did. I stumbled across a fun fact about how Oreo spent a lot of money to make their cookies kosher back in the 90s. Harmless, right? I love Oreos. I love our food channel. I love the fact that our food channel allows me to buy things like Oreos that I can write off on my taxes. And heck, it sounded like an interesting topic, so naturally I looked into why Oreo would spend tens of millions of dollars on a recipe tweak when they were already the best-selling cookie in the world. And what I found is that it wasn't just a business decision about dollars and cents, it was a personal vendetta. And from there I just descended down into grocery store conspiracies, and Big Cookie trying to smash Little Cookie into crumbles, and a cover-up that's been decades in the making. Theorists, it turns out Going Kosher was Oreo's masterstroke in a century-old sandwich cookie feud. That's right, I said sandwich cookie feud. And I'm not so sure that Oreo's on the right side of this one either, because that sweet little fun fact about Oreos being kosher is, in fact, sandwiched between two darks sinister secrets. So settle in, theorists, because while Oreo's cookies may be kosher, their alleged business practices haven't always been. It's time for Oreos to get dunked on. D dunked on, as in dunked in the milk, but also dunked on in the f Anyway, it all begins a long time ago. So here's how this whole cookie feud began. Back in the 1890s, brothers Jacob and Joseph Luce started a bakery together in Kansas City, Missouri. Jacob fell ill and went to Europe to recover. While he was away, Joseph used his seat on the company's board to take the company in a new direction and form the National Biscuit Company, today known as Nabisco. Jacob, the sick brother, was not happy about this decision, eventually recovered from his illness and returned to the States. He decided to get back into the cookie game, but not with Nabisco. Instead, Jacob started the Loose Wiles Biscuit Company with a new business partner, quickly building it up to be the second largest bakery in the U.S. behind, you guessed it, Nabisco. A large part of that success came in 1908 when the Loose Wiles Biscuit Company released the Hydrox Sandwich Cookie, a revolutionary dessert with two chocolate cookies and a cream filling. Four years later, Nabisco would release the Oreo and and, um, well, it was a ripoff of the Hydrox, and a shameless one at that. Like, there is no beating around the bush here, my friends. I mean, just look at these two cookies side by side. The circular shape, the flavorings, the colors, the filling, the biscuits, and that's not even mentioning the design. The name in the center, the ridged edges, the intricate floral-inspired pattern. It's safe to say that the Oreo was made to look like the Hydrox. Heck, even the name Oreo is a jab at Hydrox. It's a reference to the Oreo Daphne a genus of flowering mountain laurels just like the pattern on the Hydrox cookie. And this, theorists, is the first dark secret at play here. The uncomfortable truth about America's favorite cookie, nay, the world's favorite cookie, is that it's an outright ripoff of the original Hydrox. Now, there's a fine line between unethical business and good business. Say what you will about Oreo's origins, but the fact of the matter is that it was followed up by decades and decades of good business decisions on Nabisco's part. And a lot of questionable ones on Hydrox's end. Today, the original sandwich cookie has faded into obscurity, while the imitator cookie is a beloved icon the world over. And that's all thanks to marketing. First, we have got to talk about the names here. I mean, why on earth would someone name their cookie the Hydrox? Like, you might as well have named the thing hydrogen peroxide at that point. Elon Musk is master of strange names, and even he wouldn't name his kid Hydrox. But what's crazier than the name Hydrox is that Loose Wiles actually wanted for a chemical-sounding name. 
name. They named it Hydrox to recall the purity of water, as in the chemical compound of hydrogen and oxygen. See, Hydrox hit the scene at a time when other food companies were literally putting stuff like chalk, sawdust, and even sulfuric acid into food products. So purity was a really appealing marketing claim. And for a time, it worked. People loved their Hydrox. And Oreos operated at a loss for years. Perhaps Oreos would have gone the way of Hydrox, but then came the advertisements. You see, Hydrox was annoyed that Oreo copied their idea. And understandably so. But Loose Wild made the mistake of letting that pettiness creep into their ads. For decades, the Hydrox was presented to consumers not as a delightful, delicious snack, but as the first sandwich cookie. But who cares about being the first? It's about what you deliver to the person buying you. And while Hydrox was busy stamping their feet and whining about copycats, Oreos just emphasized the fact that they were fun to eat. It's fun living on a ranch, but who's having the most fun? He's riding a pony. But they're eating Oreo cookies. Delicious Oreo cream sandwich. Not to pile on here, but compare that outrageously wholesome slice of Americana to this Hydrox commercial from the 80s. You like a creamy center? Here's a creamy center. Thick, delicious, creamy, creamy. But you gotta remember my name. Hydrox. Hydrox. Don't forget. Yeah, that one, um, that one makes me really want to eat your cookie. So, to recap what we just witnessed, that was a television commercial in which a Hydrox cookie reveals himself to the audience, then gets arrested for it. Anyway, hindsight is 2020, and from where I'm sitting, it's pretty clear that Oreo had the stronger marketing strategy for, like, the entire 20th century. And the kicker is that Nabisco actually started charging more for Oreos in order to make Hydrox seem like the crummier cookie. Anyway, long story short here, Oreo managed to turn its last bagging sales around in the mid-1950s, overtaking Hydrox to be the best-selling sandwich cookie, and they've never looked back since. But despite being bested by Oreo at every turn, Hydrox always had one ace in the hole. Its recipe was kosher, whereas Oreo's was not. The Loose Wiles company did make one smart move early in its founding. In 1924, they partnered with the Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations of America to create the first kosher certification agency in the United States. Hydrox was one of the first to get approved. This move earned Hydrox a lasting commitment in the Jewish community, even to this very day. Now, let's take a moment to clarify what being kosher actually means. If you're Jewish, you could probably skip ahead a minute or two, or, you know, keep watching to make sure that the Jewish researchers that I had working on this episode aren't speaking out of turn. If not, well, Shalom Internet! Basically, the Jewish religion calls for its followers to follow kashrut, which is a set of dietary laws that describe what Jews can and can't eat, and how they can eat it. In chapter 11 of Leviticus, in the Torah, God gave Moses and his brother Aaron rules for the children of Israel. There are rules for everything that roams the earth, swims in the seas, and flies in the skies. But the only rule that applies here is this, quote, Whatsoever it parteth the hoof, and is wholly cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that may ye eat. Pigs have cloven hooves, but they do not chew their cud. Therefore, they are not kosher. That is why Oreos were historically considered treif, or non-kosher. The original recipe called for lard to give that white cream center its tasty, buttery texture. Lard is rendered from pig fat. That's right, what's that creamy stuff in the middle of an Oreo cookie? Well, amongst other things, pig fat. Mmm. -mm. Anyway, lard worked fine in the white creamy stuff for decades until the public started to get concerned about saturated fats, at which point Oreo adjusted its recipe to use hydrogenated vegetable oil instead. At that point, Oreo found themselves with a cookie that contained fully kosher ingredients, but they didn't have kosher certification because the kitchen and utensils used to prepare kosher food have to be cleansed as well. And for a company of their size, obtaining that certification would be no small or inexpensive undertaking, as it meant Nabisco would need to get their factories kosherized. Which, by the way, is apparently a real word. I looked it up. Nabisco knew the price tag of kosherization would be massive, but it would be worth the cost, right? Who wouldn't want more customers in the Jewish community? Well, it's not that clear-cut of a story. The market for kosher cookies is pretty teeny. Less than 2% of the U.S.'s population is Jewish, and a minority of those, only about 20%, actually keep kosher. Worldwide, there are about 14 million Jewish people around the world in 2010, representing 0.2% of the global population. And of those, only 50% stay kosher. So at most, you're talking about maybe 7 million new customers for a cookie that is already dominantly the number one cookie in the world. And yet, in 1994, Oreo pulled the trigger and began what's likely the most expensive
expensive corporate kosherization of all time. Why'd they do it? Well, it's not as though Oreo made their true intentions public knowledge. The company claims that it was all about ice cream. A lot of kosher certified ice cream companies apparently wanted to partner with Oreo, but couldn't because the cookie brand wasn't certified. But really, the choice to go kosher came with an added benefit for Oreo. And this benefit was both business and personal in nature. The kosher niche market was pretty much the only thing that their old rival Hydrox had going for them at that point. By going kosher, Oreo realized that they might finally be able to put their nemesis Hydrox out of business for good. And that's exactly what happened. Four years and tens of millions of dollars later, Oreo finally got their kosher certification, and by 2003, Kellogg's, who owned Hydrox, stopped making the cookies altogether. Hydrox, the original sandwich cookie, had finally been done in by the copycat. That is, until a few years ago when Hydrox came back. In 2015, a small candy company that thrives on nostalgia called Leaf Brands decided to bring back the original sandwich cookie. A return that would, go figure, also come packaged with an $800 million complaint filed against Oreo's parent company, Mondelez International. And this, theorists, is the other dark secret that I teased earlier in the video. Oreo, after all these years, is still allegedly playing dirty to kill off Hydrox. Only this time the battle's happening in the grocery store cookie aisle. I mean, it sounds crazy, but since 2015, Leaf Brands have found example after example of Hydrox being hidden behind Oreo packages, being turned sideways on the shelf, being shoved to the back of the shelves, moved to the top shelves, pretty much anywhere except for where the consumer could easily see them. Why would that have anything to do with Mondelez International or Oreo brand? Because Mondelez is literally in charge of product placement on cookie shelves. That's right, these days, big companies like Mondelez International, who spend a lot of money on in-store marketing, can actually become what's known as category captains for their aisles. This means that they decide how the shelves are laid out, not just for themselves, but also, strangely enough, for their competitors, which is just like the most monopolistic thing out there. It is so insane. It'd be like letting Babe Ruth umpire a Yankees game. It's like letting a defendant judge his own trial. It's like letting Food Theory choose your suggested video feed. Okay, maybe that one isn't so bad. Furthermore, Mondelez has the resources to do direct store distribution, meaning they send their own people to physically place the products on shelves rather than letting the store handle it. So when a certain product is regularly found hidden or out of place or in an inconvenient position, there's a good chance either the category captain or the person stocking the shelves is to blame. And in Hydrox's case, Mondelez is often both. Basically these days, the grocery store is cutthroat and there's no place for the little guy. So does this mean that Hydrox is doomed yet again? Has it slipped to the bottom of the milk glass and gotten soggy and inedible? Not so fast. If Hydrox wants to be the little brand that could, ironically enough, they just need to go back to their roots. Just like the cookie, this story is coming full circle. Remember how I said in the early 20th century consumers were really concerned about food purity because of the literal poisons that were being stuffed into the food that they were purchasing? And that's why Hydrox got their name? Well, today, we seem to be going through that exact same process. Asking ourselves what we're eating and if it's doing more harm than it's worth. And wouldn't you know it, but Leaf Brands is producing the reborn Hydrox using the original Loose Wiles recipe, which calls for all non-GMO ingredients, including real cane sugar and real vanilla. Realistically, Hydrox is gonna get way more bang for their buck advertising as a healthier alternative to Oreo rather than sticking with the same griping and borderline flashing that they'd been doing for decades. And best of all, we know that that strategy can work in the face of juggernauts like Oreo, Nabisco, and Mondelez. Let me introduce you to Tate's Bake Shop, a small brand of chocolate chip cookie that, in less than 20 years, broke through the crowded cookie market to give Mondelez, a company that made billions in the cookie aisle, a run for their money. The reason Tate's Bake Shop was so successful was that it was a premium product made with the same ingredients that you or I would use to make cookies. Chocolate chips, unbleached flour, butter, eggs, vanilla, you know, normal sounding stuff, not chemical names. And it worked. People were snatching them up, causing an upheaval in the chocolate chip cookie market strong enough to get Mondelez to purchase the brand for $500 million in 2017. Hydrox has the same advantage, so use it. Why not try something different? And if you don't mind, might I suggest starting with the name? But hey, speaking of fresh, healthy ingredients, maybe you should try something different today, like HelloFresh, the sponsor of today's episode. Theorists, do you want 12 free meals delivered right to your door with zero delivery charge? No nothing? Just free food immediately on your doorstep. Well then, 
listen up. Go to HelloFresh.com by clicking the code down in the description and use the code FOODTHEORY12 to get 12 free meals, including free shipping. Heard that right, 12 meals all delivered right to your door for free. Like, if that's not a deal that's worth giving a try, I don't know what is. HelloFresh sends recipes and meal kits straight to your door every week. And let me tell you, the ingredients arrive on time, they're fresh, and the meals are delicious. Running four channels that produce six videos a week, plus having a two-year-old, my time is pretty tight these days. So having the meal decisions and ingredient shopping taken care of by HelloFresh is a lifesaver, meaning that my free time stays free. I'm not having to run as many errands or choose what to eat. It is there for me on the doorstep, giving me more time to play with Ollie, to relax, and read up on the disturbing histories of all my childhood favorite brands so I can ruin them in the series for you. Seriously, for our family, HelloFresh helps me avoid just grabbing fast food for every meal. It works a variety of high-quality meals into our week, avoids getting into recipe rut, and has really cut down on my blackout sandwich cookie binges. HelloFresh is an absolute lifesaver. It's also an earth saver. HelloFresh's carbon footprint is 25% lower than that of meals made with store-bought groceries, and they gave over 4 million meals to charity last year. So thank you to HelloFresh. I really appreciate your sponsorship. And also sometimes I dream about your garlic bread. Remember, theorists, link is in the top line of the description. HelloFresh.com and Food Theory 12 at the checkout for 12 free meals, no delivery fees. And lastly, remember, it's all just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit.